happy to host this uh, little uh, workshop on a lot of shit because what we're going to show is uh, a few problems and how maybe to handle them and be aware even us with a lot of experience cannot handle all the problems sometimes you are in trouble when you do very complex cases so we have uh, we some who is working in Norwich we have Abdul who is working in Riyadh and we have Fadi who is working in Lebanon I'm Eric and I'm from Belgium but working in uh, Germany in Nuremberg so welcome everybody and we're going to talk really about complex EVA and FIVA and BIVA we may include chimney EVA as uh, this is also a technique that is being used for aneurysms that have no neck uh, and it would be wrong not to discuss it even if I would probably say that FIVA is a better solution whenever you have time to do FIVA. So if you talk about, before I start my first presentation, if we talk about complex EVA or TIVA, what is it for? What, what do you, I feel free to speak out. What, what, what do you think about? What, what is coming up in your mind? The sizing, the planning, the difficulty, the landing zones, the uh what can go wrong, all the pre-operative preparation is important, I think. Okay, more. so you, you say it's more complex, so it requires more work, and, but you also mentioned the anatomy. Yes. Mm -hmm. So for which anatomies are we going to think about more complex solutions? Angulations. Yes. Well, you know, if you have angulations and a very long neck, you can choose one of the softer, more flexible grafts, and you will probably make it. Paravisceral. What do you mean with that? No neck below the renals. Martin? Short, aggressive necks. That's a nice word. Aggressive necks. Huh? That's the what they call the borderline suitable or the, the complex or the, yeah. I, I think a neck is either a neck or not a neck. So either you have a good portion of the aorta below the renal arteries and then you can do EVA and anything that is not nice, it would be fair to say that this will probably not be durable. So it is about the proximal neck and I think you know, that's the one answer. If you talk about FIVA, if you talk about BIVA, branched EVA or fenestrated EVA, it's for aneurysms where you don't have a neck below the renals. And that can extend up to a type 2 or extend to toracoabdominal aneurysm. That's not a problem. So what we need is to find a region where we can start, the proximal neck. And with fenestrated EVA, we, so to speak, create a neck by going above those important target vessels and then creating holes in the grafts or branches uh, in the grafts to accommodate those important branches because that's the main issue okay so we talked about the proximal neck we talked about the fact that why why would you in viva and viva need to really find a good proximal landing zone any idea but you need to seal but even more than that compared to standard EVA you only have one chance because if you're going to make such a complex repair you're not going to jeopardize for the people here or the people in the whole room? <laughs> okay, good. So I don't need to shout. Okay, so we were talking about uh, the proximal neck. We were talking about finding a neck that is really not only suitable, but will also be durable. Because if this repair fails, you are in trouble. And believe me, in our experience, we have 
repaired failing FIFA or failing BIFA, and that's not a nice game. That's not a nice day at work, believe me. So with FIFA, actually, what we do is we create normally a neck of three to five centimeters. You more discuss the planning. When we plan our grafts, we really plan in such a way that we will have friction sealing in the aortic wall for about three to five centimeters. Yeah. So not like the small boys doing standard EVA and saying one and a half centimeters, centimeter. actually I don't believe in one centimeter because I'm not that good. I'm not that good. So if I only have one centimeter and during my procedure, I'm going to lose another one, two, three millimeters because I'm not getting the graft really at the level yeah. of the lower renal artery. Suddenly you have an neck that is seven, eight millimeters. And then it also depends on the length of your proximal stem. Because if your proximal stem, like in the Cook device, is 22 millimeters and it seals only seven, eight millimeters and it's oversized, that stent will want to do this. Yes. And that's not a good thing. So there are a number of reasons why you should be extremely careful with short necks. Having said that, we are still only there to give the best possible advice for the patient. And sometimes patients have unhappy anatomies and have unhappy uh, anatomical features, but also general features, their, their age, their comorbidity, uh, previous surgery, that doing something that you would not choose in another patient, maybe here would still be the best. So, so even if we sometimes are black and white and are very strict when we are on the podium and saying, you should not doing this is maybe still the best option for this patient. So keep in mind, that's what I do with my team. I ask them, you have an aneurysm and I want to do something. And maybe I'm not very happy about this. I said, okay, what are your options? Yes, but go back to your options. What are the options? Are the options no treatment, open surgery, standard EVA, complex EVA, for us sometimes, but very rarely, chimney EVA or another agent, like with staples, and go through all these options and find your best solution. Okay, so. Funny. Uh, uh, you're going to discuss a lot about the anatomic uh, challenges and so on. Any patient uh, issues that are going to be filled in terms of being high or high, uh, for example, kidney disease? How do you look at a patient with chronic kidney disease, with a certain degree of chronic kidney disease? Okay, so comorbidity with regard to renal function. It's an important one, we know it. We can accommodate that by using diluted contrast, by using less contrast. Yesterday, I had a discussion with Javaira, who said, I'm doing everything with uh, IVUS, and I virtually don't use contrast. I can do my complex cases with very little. We have fusion technology in the new hybrid rooms, so you can reduce <clears throat> the amount of... You can also do when you control whether you are in a target vessel, instead of doing a full-blown angiogram, do a little contrast injection under fluoroscopy and then save that sequence. These are all little techniques that help you A, reduce the contrast use and B, uh, reduce uh, the fluoroscopy times or the radiation issues. Hmm? Uh, in the end, also there, you will have to decide whether for this patient uh, it is now uh, still thank you it is now still uh, an option or you should not do it and wait example giving the patient that is almost going on dialysis when patients have a, a, a clearance of less than 20 then usually i try to wait as long as possible or I discuss with the nephrologist, listen, if we do this and we do controls, the chances that he will go into dialysis is big. So how long do you think he will live without dialysis? If the aneurysm is not big, I will wait for the dialysis to be effective, to be 
settles in and then do the aneurysm. You can't do that with an eight centimeter aneurysm, then you have to discuss that, you know, we're going to treat your aneurysm, but it may cause dialysis to start a bit earlier. So that's the comorbidity. Now the other thing you mentioned or didn't mention is the access. Is access important in fenestrated and branched EVA? Why is that? Well, because it's, it's the Achilles heel of these complex ones. They come with large um, diameters, the devices. Um, and quite often that we get dragged into looking at the anatomy of the visceral visceral like somebody if somebody brings me a CT and say what do you think this is is this suitable for complex straight away you look look for the neck look for the vessels one thing you don't look at straight away is the axis so that's that's very important I think you are completely right and and the reason access is important is twofold first as we some said is most of these devices, especially if you add indwelling wires, inner branches, etc., most of these devices will come with larger introduction systems. So therefore, access is important. But the second reason is that with these devices, you will have to rotate them, you will have to orient them, you will have to correct the orientation during the deployment. So you need some torqueability. So having small access, or angulated access, or calcified access is actually the one thing that terrifies me most. Because if I have a, let's say, triple fenestrated graft, and by the way, we virtually don't do double fenestrated grafting anymore. So the, the, the standard fenestrated grafts are grafts with three fenestrations and a double width scalp for the celiac. That's for all the short neck and juxtarenal aneurysms. And if you have a reason to go higher because your neck is too short, or you may think that you need to extend later into a diseased thoracic aorta, which happens, then you do a four fenestrated graft and you start three, four centimeters above the ceiling. So these grafts, when you insert them, you will have to reorient them for the catheterization. Now, if I'm talking about the Cook fenestrated graft, you know that this graft can be deployed, but it's still deployed only to about 60, 65% of the intended diameter. So it is, is a corset because at the back, there are, there are diameter reducing ties. But this is on purpose to allow you to rotate your graft. So don't forget that for each vessel, you will have to correct the orientation of your graph because if the holes are well oriented based on your planning and measurement, when the graft is only open 65%, they cannot be ideally oriented. Okay. So you will have to orient that, catheterize your target vessels one by one, and only when you are satisfied with your catheterization and you have two or three guiding sheets, I only use two all the time, because that reduces the need for 20 or 22 or 24 French on the left side. So my guiding sheet, I always use the Gore uh, dry seal sheet. I always use an 18 French sheet. And even if I have four fenestrations, I have four wires in my four target vessels, then I will introduce two, six or seven French ANL guiding sheets into the target vessels and then open my graft. And only then will normally the graft come into the perfect orientation for all four target vessels as you planned it. Yeah. Can I just add a third point about that? Another point why it's important for previous EVAR. And if, you know, if somebody had previous cut downs uh, in the groins, uh, it becomes a little bit more tricky as well. That's why I think the argument for cut down versus percutaneous probably is over now. If, if you can do it percutaneous, try to do it percutaneously, the first, I mean, the, the standard you are, to make life easier for the future interventions. Okay, so he's opening another topic. <laughs> so, who is doing his cases in general percutaneously and who is doing it by open means? Who is doing it percutaneously? 
okay? Who is doing it by oak beads? Who is using both techniques? Okay, so I agree and, and, and we are a big fan. I must say that for a long time we continue to do open approach for two reasons. First of all, you can choose your entry site, so your open, your loop. We do little purse fix futures, uh, two per hole, and then we puncture in the middle. We can choose the best possible spot, and at the end, we just tie those knots, and that works very well. But it is an open approach. It creates problems with the femoral approach that should be minimized in good hands, but, but, but still. It is so, so the open approach has its pro, pros and cons. With the pro styles that we use from Abbott, I must say that the percutaneous approach works very well. So anytime we have decent arteries, anytime we can puncture on the ultrasound nicely and put the pre-close technique into place, we do it. The only reason not to do it for us is in cases where we expect that it may take longer, and with longer for us, I mean longer than one and a half to two hours. So I'm not talking about a standard triple fenestrate or uh, quadruple fenestrate, I'm talking about more complex cases. There we like to do it open because we use that technique with first wing futures. And that technique allows us to remove the sheets, only leave the slip wire in position, and then put the Rummel Stonica on these first spring sutures and close it, which means that we have flowed through the limpic cap. And I think that is a very important asset to reduce the risk of paraplegia. So in my team, restoring blood flow as quickly or at least one limb as quickly as possible is really a number one priority so you have to i don't know what you I'm think about with some infrarenal. I'm about mm -hmm. infrarenal ones, you know? yeah if you're talking about standard eva it's a no-brainer if you have decent arteries you can do it percutaneously and and i would agree with with some it works very well okay so just a few items but don't forget that access is important because yesterday or the day before we discussed cases where they didn't manage to deploy the graph correctly and i think one of the problems is access because remember that your iliac arteries are uh, are doing this and this may cause the graft to really rotate and, and to talk and a graph i will show that it can be torqued in the system. So you have to go from top to bottom slowly, control your orientations and correct misinformation at one by one. So if you allow me, I will go through this presentation and then you can find for the cases, first case, second case, third case. I have another 10 cases if you want, so don't worry that we can. For the access. Okay, to, uh, okay, I'm sure we're going to cover this. We, we, we face that frequently with families as well for the city. What's your threshold to intensify uh, the shockwave uh, the effects on the access to facilitate the parameters? Yes, I will repeat the question. Uh, some people have a softer voice, a nicer voice. Some people have a more brutal voice that you can hear. <laughs> Advantages, disadvantages. Yeah, it's uh, <coughs> normal. So the question was about access IVL, so intravascular lithotripsy, uh, to uh, enhance. So IVL has been used. I haven't used it yet, but I have two cases coming up where I may use it. And I heard that it works reasonably well. Um, for standard EVA, with the systems we have now, with 18 French, um, I think you will get through almost everything. If you have complex cases where you go to it might be cumbersome and there is a limit at some stage it doesn't work if you have this ugly combination of small vessels but also very calcified and angulated then uh, it, it's better to do but maybe IVL will solve these I, I have no experience with it yet uh, I heard only anecdotal experiences so so to be followed 
and 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 indeed some people are very small both male and female and have very small vessels this is also something to take into account so let's go through this uh, <clears throat> top 10 uh, tips and tricks in fenestrated and branch viva and you will see that we already discussed a number of them uh, my disclosures uh, i think the most important about this slide is really that I have probably done all possible mistakes and seen all possible complications. And as I discussed with Mo, my role is really to, to report them in order to make you avoid them. And, and that is, that is uh, uh, what I'm uh, trying to do mostly. Um, we are, no doubt, always trying to push the limits. That's normal. Uh, we see patients and we try to find solutions. But we need to be, be cautious. And I said it before. Um, so, so, so we need to find the, the best solution. And unfortunately, we need to find solutions when intraoperatively something doesn't go as planned. Which is, this is the wrong application of uh, pushing the limits. This patient had EVA in 2010, and as usual, I never get those old images to say, well, maybe I would not have done it, very cautiously, not brutally, but, and then he, he had an endoleak, unfortunately, so there was a problem with the proximal neck, and they decided to do a cuff with a periscope. So not a chimney, but a periscope. So that's an inverted chimney, but that creates drama if it doesn't work because afterwards you are completely blocked. And then they use coils, they use onyx, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And this aneurysm continued to grow and have a, um, uh, an endoleak. So in Greece, Thanos, my good friend, who worked with me for many years and is now working part-time with me and part-time in Greece, I uh, came with this case and we needed a very, very complex solution with inner branches inverted to repair this completely. So I think what I'm trying to say with this case is everybody has problems. That in say is not an issue. But if you have problems, you better think twice how to solve these problems and to keep an open mind future solutions if you have to ask help for somebody and you know most of the people around are happy to give you advice or to support you if there is this ugly case coming up so i think overall and, and it's interesting in this meet that we are four vascular surgeons a mix it would have been better to have a mix of interventionologists and vascular surgeons no doubt what we need is a balanced indication between open and fenestrated and branch EVA. People always ask me, are you doing open surgery? I say, yes, we are doing open surgery. Give an answer. Our centers, because they can't be treated by open means, and they are referred to us for a complex endovascular solution. So that percentage is biased. I think. By now, we should adhere to the principle that if possible, I said it before, if possible, if another solution, if not absolutely needed, we shouldn't do standard EVA in a devious neck, in a neck that is too short. You know, I always say the guy who invented the terminology tapered neck should be sent on a rocket to the moon and never allowed back on Earth because for me, a tapered neck is not a neck. How can you say that this is a neck? This, this doesn't work. So, and, and too many people still continue to do standard EVA in those cases. So, don't do it. And Shiva, and here I'm brutal because I'm a rich Western European. I can say that in this environment we are very poor. But, but I realize that fenestrated and branched is still not available everywhere as it should be. And, and for us in Germany, where I work, Chiva is not the first option. So if we think about a patient 
that has no trace. By the way, with some, you know how many redo cases we do? And FIVA after EVA, where you say, oh, I can clamp here and I can suture you here, but it's two, three centimeters below the renals. And that bulby aorta below the renals continues to progress. And astomotic uh, problems, progression of disease in general. So it would be fair to say that if you want to do a good repair in a young person, maybe clamp above the renal arteries and shoot chair the grafts just at the level of the renal arteries is the best solution to avoid problems. But we see problems also after open repair. <clears throat> good, so we were saying that chimney EVA in some countries maybe is still the first option because Fedastrate is not available. And that is absolutely fine with me. I have to accept that or, or we have to accept that. In our countries, I think now we have enough evidence to demonstrate that chimney EVA is inferior to the two main other options, that is FIVA or open surgery. So let's go to the 10 tips and tricks. Well, the first one is uh, it's very easy. Miracles only happen now and then, so be prepared and work hard. You said it, Mo, if I think about complex EVA, oh, I have to work, I have to plan, I have to organize. Well, it's true, because it doesn't come alone. You have to work on it. The second one is, again, it's complex, but you need to do a complete evaluation and planning. You need to look at your indications